Good evening. Good evening. I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us online and being a part of our live audience. Well, our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39. I'm sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, many of you know and love our guests tonight, Bethany Anglin McClellan and her mother, Debbie Anglin. Bethany was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer at the age of eight. I first met Bethany, I think this was in middle school, when I was shooting a video highlighting the one-armed cheerleader that they were talking about. <laughs> Bethany and her family have faced many challenges and struggles through the years, but their faith in God is very, very strong. And you'll hear their story right after this video. This story may not have a happy ending, but the people in it don't focus on an end. They focus on each day together. Last Christmas, a little girl learned she had a very rare, very aggressive cancer. This Christmas, she has a healthy philosophy and a unique present that's changed her life. Bethany Anglin has made friendship bracelets for as long as she can remember. She made them before and after her arm was amputated. Bethany's right arm is an electric prosthesis, and it made news the very day she lost her arm to cancer. Well, the day that they amputated her arm, that night, the teacher came to the hospital and she said, you're not going to believe what was in the weekly reader today. This article helped Bethany tolerate a lot of chemotherapy because she knew when she was well enough, her parents would take her to Houston to buy the $14,000 arm. This is the battery pack and you, we have the charger and I've got three batteries and you can take the batteries out and just pull down the glove. And there's two electrodes right here and here. And this one over here can close it and this one here opens it and I just control it with my muscles. Bethany says she can do a lot of neat things with her new arm, even hang from the monkey bars. Oh, I can hold a cracker. I can hold a cracker and put the butter or whatever I want on it. And that was pretty interesting because I didn't think, I thought it would just crush it right then. Okay, okay, arm goes Does above your head. Do you think they'll find anything? I hope not, don't you? Let's pray, okay? Bethany still spends a lot of time at the hospital no, though because her kind of cancer often comes back. CAT scans, x-rays, and blood tests are a fact of life. But it's a fact they don't dwell on. What I tell Bethany and Terry and Jake is um, you cannot worry about tomorrow. You live today and live it to its fullest because none of us have any guarantees. You were so good, I tell you. Okay, you can hop down. This CAT scan brings yet another Christmas present to the Anglins, a clean bill of health for Bethany. Sorry, this is your spleen, okay? This is your stomach coming in and all this is your liver. The nightmare they had last Christmas is fading. Amputation sounded horrible until you think about not having her at all. You know, a little less of her isn't all that bad when you've got Bethany. And Bethany is getting yet another Christmas present, this one from the Dream Makers organization. Her wish is to meet teen heartthrob Kirk Cameron, so the whole family is headed to California in January. What a fascinating story. Special a little girl. Wonderful little uh, girl. What message would you give other individuals such as yourself with this type of problem? And, and what type of inspiration? Because you look like a real inspiration to everybody out there. I, just, I have to say, just hang in there because, you know, God has played such a big role in my life and he took care of me. And I think if you just hang in there and keep believing and with people donating pledges and helping out, you know, we can find a cure for this disease. I guess it tells you that faith really works uh, itself in strange ways and uh, you, you seem to have had a lot of faith in God. That's right. He's, you know, he's wonderful and nothing compares to him. And, you know, that's the only way. Please welcome Bethany and Debbie. Thank you. Have a seat. Well, glad you can make it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And you told me before the show that you 
lost your arm. You actually <laughs> lost your arm. I did, y'all. I don't know where it is. <laughs> That's a very strange thing to say. I mean, I lost it once, but now I seem to have lost it again. It's in, the house some, it's in the house somewhere. It is. We have moved several times. I've got three kids and lots of pets and, you know, things get misplaced. So I obviously don't wear it that often anymore. So. But you usually find it. We're hoping we'll find it. We'll see. <laughs> if you had to replace it, what would it cost? That's a great question. At the time, it was around fifteen or twenty thousand. I think the last time. Probably thirty-five to forty thousand today. Thirty-five or forty thousand today. The last one she had was over wow. twenty, and wow. that was in her senior year. Well, let's go back in time to when Bethany was born. You were expecting this perfect girl, and you got a perfect girl. I did. Everything was going fine, and then, what, eight years later, something happened, or was it sooner than that? No. Well, just right before that, um, I had grabbed her hand one day, and she said, Mommy, that hurts. You hurt me. And so I looked at her arm, and she just had a little knot, and about the size of a little green pea. I took her to Dr. Fleet, our pediatrician, and she pulled a little bit of a trick she showed him her left arm. Oh, really? Mm hmm And I didn't even, didn't even pay a bit of attention. So about 10 months later, we'd moved, and she was doing a cartwheel. And I said, oh, my, honey, you're going to get hurt. She was putting her fingers down and holding her hand up because it put pressure on it to sit her hand down. So that's how we found it. And, of course, I just thought it was a ganglion cyst, and I took her to our, our regular doctor, and he said, oh, Deb, he said, that's a tumor. So that got the ball going. That was in October, and I what don't think... What year was that? 1987. Okay. And, um, no, it was 88. It was 88. And um, we just weren't concerned about it. Um, and then my brother sweet brother of mine called a really good friend of his. It's a, um, a big doctor in Nashville, and he said, Barry, this isn't good. So he got her in to Vanderbilt that week. He knew that it did not sound good. And we were going to have to wait two months to see just an orthopedic. So he got the ball rolling, and even when they um, took her tumors out in December, we waited till the end of school for Christmas, and they took them out. And the doctor that even removed them that day, the hand surgeon, wasn't concerned. He said, I'm 99% sure. That it was not. There, it's not malignant. Wow. And he explained that it didn't look like a malignant cell. It didn't look like a healthy cell. And he drew it on his doctor pants, you know, his, his surgical pants. And, I told, and he kept talking about it was gray. Gray in color, gray in color. Which is not good, I guess. I don't know. So I told Terry, I said, that must have been unusual. So, but anyway, he said, that was on Monday. He said, we'll let you know toward the end of the week, probably be Friday. And then we were getting ready to go to church on Wednesday night when we got the call. And talk about God's hand being in it. My husband traveled, and he was never home at night. His job, you know, he, he was gone. And uh, he was home. And when the doctor called me, he said, Miss Anglin, is your husband home? And I said, yes. And he said, I need to speak to both of you. I have some bad news. So he told us both what it was, and I wrote it down. And he started telling me that, you know, we had tests next day and the next day. And um, when you got that news, how devastating. It's got to be. A sinking feeling. I think for me, um, you know, as a child, I was eight years old. I don't think that I understood right. the gravity of the situation as it was. Um, I didn't, I knew I had had, my grandmother had passed away from cancer. And I think back then, you know, so oftentimes cancer was a death sentence. And so I think I was familiar with that, but I don't think that I fully appreciated what was about to happen and how my life was about to change. I'm sure they did. And did, were you expecting 
some cure here. This is just, well, they're going to have cancer. It's going to be treatable, and everything's going to be fine. Well, I asked him. I was just very point blank, and I said, I want you to be honest with me, and I want you to tell me the truth. What are we talking about? And he said, Miss Anglin, it is not good. He said she's going to do a year of chemotherapy and am probably going to amputate her arm and mm. then radiation. And he said, with all of that, she has a 30% survival rate. Wow. So we were getting ready to go to church. I, re I remember, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. I walked into the back of the auditorium, and the first person that I saw was my first grade teacher. And she said, hi, Bethany, how are you? And I said, Miss Mize, I have cancer. You know, I just didn't, I didn't understand right. at the time. And, um, and looking back on that, um, how our world would change and we would go through many struggles and challenges, but also how many amazing opportunities and relationships would come uh, from, from that experience. And let's and, talk about that in a minute. Let me show a picture of you before as a baby. This is you. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a cute little kid right there. You got a cute kid. <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> Another shot here when the, at the amputation. This may be gross for some people. I'm not, I'm not sure. I had just turned nine, okay. and then they did the amputation um, almost February 2nd, so just after I had turned nine years old. And so just seeing that little face, you know, it is, I'm smiling. <laughs> yeah, you seem happy here. Why are you happy? I think so. Well, it, one of the stories that I always think about they didn't know how much they were going to have to take off when they, when they went into surgery. And I think um, they had done a surgery prior to the amputation to see if the chemotherapy had slowed down the progression at all, and it hadn't. It had continued to spread kind of up towards my elbow and then down towards my fingers. So they weren't exactly sure how much they would need because they needed to get a good clean margin. And so I remember... I remember coming out of recovery and asking my parents if, if I got to keep my elbow because that was a big deal um, that I got. And it's hard to tell from this picture because my arm is swollen. It looks like a little baseball. Um, it's so swollen, but I do have a few inches, you know, beyond my elbow. And it, you can imagine it helps tremendously, you know, holding things and things like that. So there were little victories and there were little celebrations to be had even amongst a situation that seemed really bleak. So the changes and challenges that took place following this amputation, tell me about that. You know, just, I think we probably take it for granted. I have a really good friend who had just had hand surgery and she called me the other day and said, I keep thinking about you and how everything that you do with your hand, particularly your dominant hand, and I was right-handed, um, so just everything from learning how to write, to tying your shoes, to putting on your clothes, to opening packages of food. I mean, everything you do, there's a reason God gave us two hands. It's because it's very helpful <laughs> to have what, two. Was this depressing for you? To, to, you know, it takes longer to put your clothes on, to eat food or whatever. I think, I don't know if depressing is the right word. I definitely got, yeah. you know, frustrated at times. Um, just over the years, I mean, when I, we were talking about cheerleading earlier, I remember that's one of the main times I was just so frustrated because I wanted to be on the varsity squad so badly. And it was sort of an unspoken rule that you had to do a skill called a back handspring. And mentally, that was just such a, a big thing for me. And so once I got over that hurdle, it took a lot, of, a lot of practice and a lot of tears. I just wanted to be able to do it like everyone else. And once I finally was able to, um, you know, I kind of got past that mentally. It just... It well, how right. do you do that with, with one arm shorter than the other? You just use the one and you just hope for the best. You flew backwards <laughs> and, and hope, hoped it would work out. <laughs> wow. And that was a requirement to be on the squad? It was... We were a pretty competitive squad and I, I never wanted to um, inconvenience anyone. I never wanted anyone to pity me. Um, I've never wanted to be seen as disabled. And so if everyone else was going to do a back handspring, I was going to do it too. Did people, um, your, your fellow students in, in school, did they look upon you differently? Did they look down upon you? Did they pick you up or what, what, 
not physically I'm talking about, but pick you up. But. Sure. I'm so fortunate to have attended the, the Christian school that I went to. I just feel that that community rallied around me in such a way that um, I always felt supported. I always felt loved. I didn't feel, um, you know, I didn't feel different. I didn't feel made. I wasn't made to feel different. And um, I'm so fortunate and so lucky to have had that community and also the community at Madison Church of Christ. Uh, our family here took care of us and supported us in so many ways. We were just beyond blessed. Do people ask you about your arm, like when you're in the shopping for groceries or whatever? Do they, do they say anything to you? I, it's funny. I, I pretty much have, if, if not daily, at least weekly. People will certainly will stare and look. And, um, but I prefer when they ask because God made us all different and we've all gone through our unique challenges and obstacles. And I want children and other people to know it's okay to be different. And um, whatever I'm doing, I just want to hopefully be a reflection of Christ. And so instead of being bitter about it, being upset about it, um, I just want to put on a smile and I tell them that my hand got sick. If it's a, a young child, I tell them that my hand had a sickness called cancer and uh, that they had to remove it so that the rest of the cancer wouldn't spread through the rest of my body and that I'm just very blessed to still be here. Even if my arm is a little bit shorter, I still get to have half price manicures. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. Do you if, really? Do, do the yes, small sir. thing. Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> sir. If I lose a mitten, you know, I've got an extra one. So <laughs> you just, I, I really have to take a moment, though, and credit my parents because, let's try not to cry, because everyone always would commend me and say, oh, you handled it with such grace and um, such strength. And I really, I borrowed from and I leaned upon the strength and attitude of my parents. That's where I learned it. I witnessed her strength and my dad's strength and how they um, faced everything. And so that was my, I was able to emulate them. Did either one of you ask why me? Why ask God? Why, why did this happen? Or blame God even? I didn't. I, I had just started a Bible study and we were doing the book of James. And James talks about your trials. Peter does too in the book of Peter, but James talks about um, your trials and to take them with pure joy. And I focused on that, and I just realized that, you know, God has a plan, and we've got to have faith and trust and just see what that plan's going to be, and we'll just figure it out as we went. And See, we were just opposite. We got our strength from her. Hmm. So, the day they amputated her arm, some of y'all were there. We had over 50 or 60 people at Vanderbilt. And we went in to see her. And I was, I was trying not to be emotional because all I'd ever seen were war movies. And that's what I had pictured in my mind. She's going to be upset. She's going to be... <laughs> And so when we went in and, and woke her up, and that's the first thing she said in such a precious voice. She goes, Mommy, did I get to keep my elbow? And I said, mm. you did. And she went, good. And mm. she closed her eyes, and she never shed a tear. And I went out and told everybody. I said, we're going to be great. She's going to be fine. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> we we weren't expecting to be teary-eyed, but it brings it all back, you know. And, of course, this was just a few days before Christmas when we got this news. And, of course, we're thinking this is our last Christmas, you know. And, um, you know, but our church family here and our, our family, our family at school, we were just rallied. We were the most blessed people. And it was a um, a great shot in the arm. All you hear on the news is negativity. And there's so much more good. They just don't focus on it, on the news. You were uh, right-handed. Yes, sir. And you were artistic? Yes, sir. 
But I, now you're left-handed. That's right. And, and how do you? How does that work with drawing and painting? And you know, with three children, I don't. <laughs> I don't have quite as much time um, for artistic endeavors right now. I do like to bake cakes. And not your mama's like Betty Crocker cake. We throw some icing. I like to do really cool sculpted cakes. You want a bass fish? You want a banjo? I want to make it out of cake for you. Um, and so sometimes it's a little challenging to figure out how to do certain things with one hand, but you just get creative and you figure it out. And I really loved drawing when I was younger. And I had done several um, T-shirts for Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And they came to me and they wanted me to do, I don't remember what it was for, but I was so nervous about it because I hadn't done one since, I, since losing my arm. And my mom said, you know what, babe? She said, your artistic ability is not in your hand. Your artistic ability is in your mind. Mm -hmm. And that has just always stuck with me because I feel like in any circumstance, we can choose to look for the good. We can choose to look for the silver lining and focus on the positive. And that's really what, what she was telling me to do. If you had your arm here, what, what movements can you control and how does that work? Well, it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, the technology has changed a lot um, since I have used a prosthesis, but pretty much, I mean, you've probably seen the hooks that kind of go like this. This was really cool. It's called a myoelectric, and the hand looked more like a normal hand. So I really only had a function of just kind of opening and closing. But for a child that, you know, I had grown up with two hands, and so I think initially for me it was so beneficial to kind of feel, um, feel normal or feel complete and to learn to hold things and to open things. And um, it was just, it was really helpful initially. By the time I got to college, I was at the University of Tennessee, and it gets hot up there on the hill, and you're, you know, trekking along with a backpack, and if it got really hot, it would sweat, and it would fall off. <laughs> and that was, that always had great, you know, reactions from people who were um, unsuspecting, especially if I had on a long sleeve shirt that would button at the bottom, because then it would fall off and be mm. caught by the button, and it would look like I'd have this really long arm. So I didn't wear it as much in college, and I remember um, right before I got married and married my sweetie uh, in the auditorium over there, I, I asked him what he thought, if I should wear my prosthesis or not, and uh, we call the end of my arm Susie because we're just crazy like that. Susie Stump. Susie Stump. And so he just wanted to hold Susie during the wedding. And, really? And that was, uh, that was really sweet because... I didn't need anything else. I'm, I'm the way that I'm meant to be, and I'm really grateful. I hear that there are some tricks you play with your arm. I've been known to do that. Such as? Well, it was really fun with a prosthesis. For instance, if I'd go to camp and, you know, we'd want to play a trick on the counselors, I would tuck my arm into the sleeping bag where it was just kind of hanging out just a little bit. And they'd come in there, Bethany, it's time to get up. We've got to get going for the day. And they would, I, of course, I would not be in the sleeping bag, just my prosthesis. And they would go to touch it, and then it would fall out. Clarity would ensue. It's just, it's really good fun at Halloween. Uh, I have a lot of different sizes, you know, and <laughs> they get progressively larger. <laughs> but, you different uh, sizes? Different sizes. Well, because when I was little, I had a little oh, tiny course, hand. Of and we then, have a collection. Right. And so um, it was fun. I, I played softball. I, my parents were, they always encouraged me to try all kinds of different things growing up. I tried softball one year, and this was always so fun because the hand, as cool it, as it is, it takes a little bit of time to open. And so after I would hit the ball, I wouldn't have time to open the hand, drop the bat, and then run to first base. So I would hit the ball, pull off my arm, <laughs> drop it, still attached to the bat, and it was just a lot more efficient. And then the coach would come over and pick it up, and there's this arm hanging off. Of course, our team knew that, but the opposing teams <laughs> never were, you know, suspecting that. So a little taken back. That was always fun, too. It's just, you know, you've got, you've got to, like I said, you've got to look at the bright side and, and realize life is just too short to take it so seriously. Do you ever do that in a grocery store with a little kid coming up to <laughs> oh, you? Oh, that was terrible. 
we were in the grocery store, and of course, you've all heard the expression, I'm going to rip your arm off and beat you with it. Yeah. We were in H.G. Hills, and the man said, a little, man said that to the little boy really? in front of us. And she goes, Mama, Mama, let's do it. Mama, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. I said, Bethany, no, no. She goes, Mama, it'll be funny. I said, no, it won't. I said, they're going to have me arrested. She wanted me to pull her arm off and start popping her with it. So I was like, yeah, we Who can't. else thinks that would be funny? Everyone else in It'd this be room funny. thinks that would it be funny. It would have been funny because we have a big sense of humor at our house. <laughs> We're grateful that her daddy, hmm. you know, and when, before they amputated her arm and we knew it was a possibility, and Terry was wonderful, he would say to her, he goes, oh, babe, just think how much fun we can have. We'll hang, we'll get you an artificial arm, we'll put blood on it and hang it out of a tree for Halloween. And, right. you know, so he, he always is so quick-witted, would make it fun. You know, he was always wanting to make it fun. Or if he'd throw her a ball and she'd drop it, he'd go, no hand, no hand, you know. <laughs> so we we decided you can laugh and you can cry. And we had our, our time to cry, but you just can't cry about it all the time. Life goes on. And especially when you sit up in Vanderbilt and you see these children who are not going to live and they mm. would come in and say, you know, be ready because this one's going to pass tonight. And she spent about, I think it was 142 days in the hospital in that, that year. So we were there a lot. She stayed in every room on Five South. <laughs> she told them the last night, I got to have this room. And they had to move somebody. <laughs> they moved the child out of there because she said, it's my last time. I've got to get, I've got to have that room. <laughs> so, Are there any limitations uh, in your career, whether going to college or employment or anything, that, that not having the full arm? I don't, I don't think so, and I think it kind of goes back to... Or do, do the employer, does he, does he or she say, no, you are limited? Have you had that? I haven't had that happen. I had someone on Southwest once try to tell me I couldn't sit in the, the seat with the, um, the larger, you know, over the wing. The emergency. And yeah. I just wanted to laugh. I thought, and you think that this 80-year-old man with two <laughs> hands, you know, and a cane is going to be able to do a better job than I will. I tend to be pretty stubborn, and I tend to be, like I said, I want to be able to do all the things that everyone else can do. I, um, I have learned as I've gotten older that, <clears throat> you know, it's okay to not be able to do everything, and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask my, my children who are stronger than I am to open something or to, you know, ask my husband for help with something. It's okay. It doesn't show weakness. It's just human. And I think for a long time, I, I really, I wanted to be so strong and I wanted to be, didn't want to be a burden. And so I fought against that. And as I've gotten older and matured, I've just realized that, um, we all struggle with something, and it's okay. You were in the several telethons, or a few telethons in the past, and uh, what has been the result as far as a cure for, for what you have that caused you to lose your arm? And what is the name of that disease? So the, the type of cancer that I had is called synovial cell sarcoma, and it's incredibly rare, and um, my situation was unique because it's generally a young adult's disease and it's generally found in the lower extremities. And I was eight years old, and I, mine was in my hand. So everything about it was really um, odd. And even though they told us sort of the protocol and, and what we were gonna be doing, I don't know that they fully, they couldn't really tell us what was gonna happen because they didn't, you know, it, it's changed a lot since then. She um, was the third case that, that Vanderbilt had ever had in 1988, 99. I've, I've only met one other person really? in my lifetime that's had it. Wow. And it was a young, a young man, a young, a young adult. Change gears a little bit. Tell me about Kurt Cameron. Kurt Cameron. I was just texting <laughs> with him earlier today. <laughs> um, so it's the crisis. How do you know him? I know. It's back from his growing pains days. Um, 
you know, it's so funny to me. So, so oftentimes kids will pick a dream. Dream Makers was who uh, approached us about um, granting a wish. But I believe it's kind of been... It's no longer, it's now. It's now gone into make a wish, mm -hmm. I think. It's and you no longer wish for Kurt Cameron. Right? Well, oh, I no, would we... always wish for him because he's a great guy. <laughs> oh, I would never change it. But mm -hmm. so oftentimes kids will pick a trip or, or something like that. And Growing Pains was a hot show at the time. And I just thought he was the cutest thing ever. <laughs> and it's funny because when they granted my wish, they flew our family out to California and I thought, well, we'll just meet him. We'll see Growing Pains, and that will be it. Sure. And it turned into so much more than that. Our, my parents became friends with his parents, um, and we just became friends. And here we are all these years later. I lived in California uh, right after Michael and I got married. We moved out there for a little while, and we were still friends and would go to their house for Thanksgiving and all of those things. And now... He has a daughter that lives here that we've just recently gotten to see. And it's just crazy because you don't think, you think a dream or a wish is something that happens once and then it's over. But the relationships um, that came from that, I mean, that's all, y'all, that, that is all God. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, he had just become a Christian. He was 19 years old. He was old. an atheist, what I yes, understand. Yes, right? And he, he was a 19-year-old kid and... We, I'll, I'll never forget, we went to dinner after the taping of the show, and he asked if he could pray. And we were all just sort of blown away by that. We were not expecting that at all. Um, and you just think, man, how many people has he been able to reach for the kingdom? Like, golly, that is just, it's fascinating to me. And so for us to have that bond and that relationship um, because, you know, through Christ is really awesome. And you're going to get him as a guest for Story Makes It Great. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He comes to Nashville a lot, maybe. He does. <laughs> um, Camp Horizon. Yes. That's been a long time, I guess. Are you still involved somehow with the Camp Horizon? Not as, not as much now, you know, with my children and I homeschooled. I'm still homeschooling the youngest. Um, what, is so the, I, what was the pur purpose of Camp Horizon and what were your experience? So Camp Horizon is a wonderful place. Uh, it used to be put on by the American Cancer Society, but now it's uh, privately funded. It's a camp for children that have cancer or that have had cancer. And it's just a camp experience for kids where they can go, have, you know, go canoeing, go swimming, archery, the whole thing. But the difference is... They have access to medical care. Uh, doctors from Vanderbilt, nurses from Vanderbilt and St. Jude come, and so they're able to give these kids a normal camp experience while still being able to give them either treatment or um, just for emergency purposes to have them there. And y'all, to have children there that you can um, spend time with and share stories with and get to know and bond with, over your shared experience with cancer, um, it's, it, it was invaluable to me growing up to have someone, you know, because I had all these wonderful friendships through school and church. Um, but truthfully, going through cancer as a child, there's a lot to unpack there. And to be able to form those relationships and lean on those people um, is, was just such a gift and such a blessing for me. And I feel that you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I now know it, I know it to be, it has a name, it's survivor's guilt, but to watch as a child, friends that are going through the exact same experiences as, as you, and where you're able to come out on the other side healthy, and they were not as fortunate, um, that was hard to deal with as a child. It's still hard to deal with as an adult. And so I just am so grateful for my faith and for my, the faith of my family because I hurt for those people who don't have that hope. Mm. And so we know that no matter what happens, we have a hope. Mm. And so I, it hurts me for the people who don't have that. Be ready for some questions or comments in just a minute. Uh, you have some famous people in your family don't you? And <laughs> grand grandparents or her granddaddy, Johnny and tell Jack. Me, tell me about this. So I, it's so cool to me. Um, if you're a country music fan, my aunt was the queen of country music, Kitty Wells. 
Um, and my grandfather is Jack Anglin, and he was a member of the duo Johnny and Jack. Uh, but he actually passed away when my dad was a little boy on the way to Patsy Cline's funeral. Uh, but it's really cool because I love country music. I love to have that. That's um, over near a good pastor, wasn't it? Where yes, the wreck sir. Was? It, was. it was. And so I love that tie. Um, I sang a little. <laughs> my kids sang a little. That's, what, that's how you have to say it when, when you're country. You have to say sang. Um, but it's just neat. It's really cool. I don't know if many people my age group would call them famous today, but they were to me growing up. Sure. <laughs> what advice would you give for other people who are uh, experiencing a similar situation with cancer? Well, one of the things that I've come to rely on as I've gotten older is, um, you know, we're told to give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. Not when things are going great, not when everything is rosy, but we're told to give thanks in all circumstances that that's God's will for us in Christ Jesus. And it's, I, I, I think about that because looking back, uh, particularly before the amputation, that was our biggest prayer was, Lord, if this, um, you know, obviously we want to pray for your will, but we don't want this to happen. Sure. Our prayer was for that not to happen if it could be avoided. And yet, his answer was no. The amputation is what was necessary in order to save my life. So even though at the time I didn't want to give thanks for that, boy, I mean, can't you imagine how thankful I am today that that's the decision that my parents made for me, as hard as that must have been for them. So I would just tell people to even in your trials, even in your struggles, give thanks because you may not understand the big picture now, but you will one day. And God, um, he has a plan for your life. I know he does. I know he does for me. And I have, I have three little ones out there today that I was told I probably wouldn't have. Mm. Man, y'all, I always thought with that, prognosis, the 30%, I thought, man, God, God, you know, has planned for me, a big plan. He saved me. I had a 30% chance of survival. What cool thing am I going to do? Maybe I'll find a cure for cancer. Maybe I'll become some powerful attorney. Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do that. And if the greatest thing that I ever do is teach my kids about Jesus. That's pretty awesome. Mm. Powerful story. Any comments, questions? Bethany, this is Martel. Didn't you go to Jamaica on a mission trip? Yes, ma'am. And your arm, did you take your arm with you? I remember that was going to be the joke. <laughs> I, I probably did, and it was really hot in Jamaica. <laughs> and so I probably didn't wear it, you know, as much as I normally would have. Um, I always was a little bit nervous about that, about going to another country, and I didn't know culturally how people would accept me, um, but honestly, I've, I've traveled really the world, and it's been, it's been pretty awesome. We did have some interesting experiences in, in Paris. They weren't as, they're not as friendly as they yeah. are here in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, they're but, rather rude. But... Um, you know, it's just, it's just cultural differences, but Jamaica was really uh, such an amazing experience for me. Just, we still, even though I've experienced trials and struggles, my struggles and my trials are completely different than the struggles and, tri and trials that those children in Jamaica were facing. Right. And so, wow, just really opens your eyes and gives you a completely new perspective. Wow. We have a shot here of a good pastor. That was you when you were a cheerleader. Yes, sir. That's high school, I assume. Yes, sir. You I think I was homecoming 15. queen also, right? Yes, yes, sir. And you can see I'm wearing my prosthesis in that one. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Aw, these are fun pictures. You know, I, again, going to a really small school was such a blessing for us because we were just completely supported. I remember, I think I went to school... 20 something days after Christmas, the year that I was on chemo. Mm. And I found out something interesting. I ran into my 
third grade teacher, Miss Rita Foster. I saw her recently, and I haven't seen her in probably 30 years. And I just hugged her, and I said, you know, I'm so grateful for you and what you did for me that year that I was sick. And she said, it's so interesting. She said, the president of the school at the time, William Rule, came to her and said, we know Bethany's not going to be here a lot. Every day that she's here, I want you to make it fun. Really? And I want you to make it uh, just a great experience for her. And she did, and those kids did. And I ended up being tutored later, um, you know, throughout the summer so that I could pass on to fourth grade. But I'm telling you what, a a body of believers in that school, that is, um, that's how we survived. It's how we made it, made it through those really, really dark, difficult days. Rita called me one day from school, and she was just boohooing on the phone. And I thought, oh, what's happened? And I said, Rita, what is wrong? Is Bethany all right? And she said, oh, Debbie, said, this is the sweetest thing. Said, out of all of the children in that third grade class, she said, the one you would have never picked got up, and she was chasing a piece of paper trying to cut it out, and she was trying to hold it with Susie, and it was just scooting all over the table. And he got up from across the room and came over. He never said a word. He picked it up, and he held it for her, and she cut it out. And she said, thank you. And she said, you just don't know the lesson that these children, she is teaching them so much. Mm. And so it was a time for everybody to grow. And I think that's part of God's plan. You know, we, we wanted to blossom. So, can't feel sorry. Rails? Oh, Bethany, could you tell us uh, how you and Michael came to be a couple? How we came to be a couple? Well, I consider myself quite a lucky lady. (laughs) It's interesting because I met my wonderful husband at this very church. We were in the youth group together, and we kind of became friends in the youth group and uh, attended a summer camp at Lipscomb called Impact and got to know each other and were friends. You know, y'all, I was just too cool for school back in the day. I just (laughs) wasn't interested in being anyone's girlfriend (laughs) um, until later. And I thought, what am I doing? This guy's amazing. And so we started dating. I was 19 and he was 18. Um, And the rest is history. I knew right away. I knew right away that he was the one for me. And I think my parents knew too, which is interesting. They saw little signs. We that... took him out. We all went to dinner, and I'll never forget it because we were sitting in this nice restaurant, and Bethany had ordered a baked potato, and it had a pepper mill, and that's mm. something that she can't do. And Michael, he never said a word. He just picked it up, and he did a potato, and he set it down, <laughs> and he had such impeccable manners. And when we got in the car, I said, he's it. He's the guy, you know. So. Well, it's, it's funny because the day that um, we were sitting together with the doctors and they were trying to explain to me what amputation meant, I didn't understand what that meant. And when my mom said, you know, they'll have to cut your hand off and then you won't have a right hand anymore, and what was the first thing I said? She said, oh, mommy, nobody will ever want to marry me. <laughs> And I said, oh, honey, people are going to love you for who you are. That's not going to matter. And Terry shared that story at the rehearsal dinner. I see. Wow. And it's true. God knew. God knew that day that he had made Michael, you know, for me and me for Michael. And just to have such a, um, a strong man of faith and leader of our family, I'm just, I am very blessed. Would you tell us the story of how you talked to your hand before the surgery? <laughs> I, I think we all have ways that we cope with things and ways that we kind of the self-talk that we do to get ourselves psyched up for things in our lives. And the day before the surgery, all kinds of people were coming, uh, family members and friends from church, 
And I would have them come in and say goodbye to my hand because they weren't going to see it anymore. And you know, what a, what a crazy thing to think. One moment, you know, you're awake and you have two working hands. Right. And then the next moment you awake and it's a completely different reality. Wow. And so for me, that was, uh, it was a good closure. It was really good closure for me to say, this is going to be the end of this era. We're moving on to a new chapter. Wow. And um, that was just the way that I, is that how you remembered it? Oh, but she was very dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Flat came in and she said, kiss my hand goodbye because you'll really? never see it again. And then she pulled out some little strands that was left of her hair and said, and keep these too. And Steve had to leave the room and go out and cry. He was just torn up in pieces. She was very dramatic about Such it. a good attitude. Amazing. Um, talk a little bit about some of the jobs that you've had. I was fascinated when you told me you worked in Hollywood <laughs> and you were, uh, what was the, what was the I duties? Was a casting director. Casting director. Yes, sir. Tell me about some of the people that you cast or didn't cast. Oh, man. Y'all, I loved that job. It was so fun. I moved to California with Michael when we, we first got married because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I was... My parents can tell you I was really good at arguing growing up. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> and so I just had that in my mind. I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went to Pepperdine Law School for a little while, and the Lord revealed to me that that was not what I was meant to do. I'm a very <laughs> creative person. And so I ended up uh, auditioning for a game show. Michael and I went to audition for a game show. I hit it off. Which with one? Lingo with Chuck Woolery. It's a letter game. It's so good. Um, and the casting producer and I just kind of hit it off, and so she offered me a job instead. And so I worked with her on all kinds of different reality shows and game shows, and they're having me cast all kinds of things from bodybuilders to sumo wrestlers. I mean, it was, it was a crazy, it was crazy, but it was creative and it was fun, and I'm such a people person. <clears throat> It, it really suited my personality, I think, much more so than being a lawyer. <laughs> right. Wow. So, and then just since moving back to Tennessee, um, my job, my career, my joy is being a mom and a wife and um, homeschooled my oldest two until sixth grade and then fifth grade. And now I've just got one at home and it is an absolute joy. Any final words? I've got one question. Uh, Bethany, since you just brought up being a mother, uh, I wonder if you would share, or perhaps Debbie would share, uh, the mama bear story from Shoney's and what uh, real love is. Y'all, she's 4'10", but don't you mess with her. Mm -mm. She will get big on you. <laughs> We were in Shoney's, and it's, it's, that was her favorite place. Every week when she'd get out of the hospital, Terry would say, anywhere you want to go, I want to go to Shoney's. <laughs> I want the chicken tenders, and she loved their sauce. What was it? It was yeah, some kind of honey know. mustard or something. Right. And so we were in there eating. And so across the room was another family, and it was the mom and dad and a grandparent and two children. And they could not stop staring. They just stared at us, and you could <laughs> see them, you know, and they kept talking, and they stared, and... Kept walking by the table. So they got up and walked <laughs> by the table, and they're looking, and they go sit down, and here comes the grandmother. Well, I just had had <laughs> enough of it. And I said, Bethany, get up. <laughs> and we walked over there, and I said... Well, hi, I'm Debbie Anglin, and I see you are fascinated with my daughter, and I want you to meet her. And I said, this is Bethany. And uh, I said, I just want y'all to meet her. I see that you're just so fascinated. And we turned around and went back and sat down. I just wasn't going to let them get away with it. I had, to, <laughs> I had to let them know that, you know, that that probably wasn't right. very Christ-like. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the truth. I was really aggravated, you know. I think she just, like any parent, you just want to protect your child. And, you know, I was nothing to be embarrassed of. And she taught me that. I don't have to be embarrassed of the way that I look 
or ashamed of my situation. I don't have to be in fear. I don't have to, you know, I can, I can be who I am. And I like who I am. Sure. We do too. Thank you. We're glad that you could be a part of uh, Stories from Ace of Grace and share that story. Thank you. Excellent story. Anything else you want to leave with us before we go? She's awesome. I have one sweet story. Okay. Um, Jake was a year ahead, her brother. And so we were going to an end of the year party. And we were going to this swimming party. And so she was a little embarrassed because she had crushes on all the boys <laughs> in, in Jake's grade. And so uh, we get there. And she, before we got there, she goes, Mommy, what if I can't swim? And I said, oh, babe, I know you're going to be able to swim. Yes, don't you think that? You're going to be able to swim. So I went on in to the other moms in the house, and she sat in the car for a while. So she finally came out, and she was embarrassed, number one, to take her hat off in front of these little boys that she had crushes on. And so she finally took her hat off, and she just real kind of went and sat by the pool. And again, one of Jake's friends in his class came swimming over, and I saw him talking to her. And so he encouraged her to get in the water, and she got in, and so she came running in the house, and she goes, Mommy, Mommy, I can swim. And I said, You sure can, darling. Well, I just boo-hooed, you know, because I knew that he had been over there to encourage her. So the kids were just wonderful to her. They really were. Um, <laughs> Nyla Cheryl knocked her hat off in front of the whole school. And so uh, when Nyla called me, she was just devastated. <laughs> and she was getting some kind of award. And so I said, well, what did she do? She said, she was great. She just leaned down and put her little hat back on and just, you know, kept smiling. So she had a good self-image. She didn't let it bother her and she wasn't ashamed. And, you know, that's that's God. And what was the name of that boy who swam over? Do you still remember his name? Stevie Steve Powers. Stevie okay. Powers Ryan, yes. Uh, Stevie Powers, yeah. yes. I'll never forget it. All right. Everybody was great. Thank you for Thank being with you, us. Guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Thank you. I want to close with a poem that you wrote oh. in 1989. I'm feeling better today, much better today, so I wrote this poem in a very special way. I thank all of you for all that you do, making me feel better and not so blue with friends like you. And God holding my hand, I know I'll be fine, and I'll make a stand. So please keep praying that I'll soon be well. Thanks so much. You're all really swell. <laughs> By Bethany in 1989. Well, thank you for joining us and take time to share your story of Amazing Grace with someone this week. And uh, thank you for coming by. And we'll see you next month on Stories of Amazing Grace.